Lesson 4, The Greatness of Greece. We're going to talk first about Plutarch's life of Solon. Then I'm going to talk about Herodotus's histories, and then we're going to talk about Pericles' funeral oration in Thucydides. We're transitioning today from three days in which we did epic poetry, and then starting tomorrow we're going to get into tragic drama and philosophy, so we're moving through different types of works. Let's jump into Solon. I just want to flag a few things about him quickly. The first thing about Solon is his attitude toward work and business. We find among intellectuals a lot of snobbery toward people who are in business, making money is bad, and so on and so forth. Solon stands out as one of the few thinkers in the Western tradition to not take this kind of snobby, condescending attitude toward business and people who make money. So if you have a highlighter handy, I would highlight this. He began as a businessman. In those days, work conferred no disgrace. Some traders founded cities. The philosopher Plato even sold olive oil to pay for a trip to Egypt. Solon enjoyed the merchant's license that taught him about foreign customs, gave him practical experience, and gained him the friendship of kings. And I think we can see how this life in trade would have seasoned Solon to lead Athens. It gave him a lot of experience with different kinds of peoples and governments, made him a man of the world and a natural leader. Plutarch also tells us he saw no reason why a man of integrity should despise money. So we're talking about a balanced view toward wealth and trade and money. I think people could argue that this pro-commercial view made Athens into the greatest power in Greece, because Athens and her province of Attica really didn't have a lot of natural resources. But Athens became wealthy and powerful because Solon encouraged people to go into business and trade. The next thing I want to talk about is a very striking passage in which Plutarch, the biographer of Solon, relates the pessimism of the philosopher Thales. Now, Thales has refused to get married or have kids because he's afraid that things won't end well and he'll be super sad if something bad happens. This prompts Plutarch to go off the track of the story and to consider this pessimism of Thales and then to argue against it. Now, any time you see the author's energy slough off somewhere and kind of obsess about something like this, you can tell that's something that's important to him because he's spending his time and his energy there. Plutarch reflects, Refusing to make a family would not free anyone from fear of loss unless he also avoided having friends and a country. Nature, too, has formed us for affection. She made us to love just as to think and remember. We attach ourselves to things outside us. You can't renounce everything because then you couldn't do anything. You couldn't have a favorite flavor of ice cream, for instance, today, because then that flavor might not be available. He says that some of these people who refuse to make families nevertheless get attached to dogs, and then they grieve and they have big, elaborate funerals for their dogs. But they think they're being all philosophical by not having a family. So it doesn't make sense. But if Solon wasn't a pessimist like Thales, he wasn't a naive optimist either. And that's clear from a very famous quote, maybe the most famous quote from this account of Solon. Solon says to King Croesus of Lydia, Life holds all kinds of changes for human beings. Things go well for us sometimes, but the future that bears down on each of us varies depending on unknowable factors. And here's the one line that you should highlight. We should call no man happy before he's dead. Now what he means by that is, essentially, it's not over till the fat lady sings, if you've ever heard that expression. You can't really tell how it ends until it ends. But it became proverbial wisdom, a catchphrase in ancient Greece. We should call no man happy before he's dead, when we'll really understand how things really turned out for him through the last act of his life. Moving on, let's just talk about this debate the Athenians had about equality. The rich expected equality based on merit, the poor and equality based on numbers. I just want to point out that this was 2,500 years ago, and that I think that's exactly the debate on equality we're having now with critical race theory. So, we would be considered the rich because we live on the Upper East Side and you guys go to private schools, and we think we should have equality based on merit, and everyone should have an equal chance to let their merit shine. But then other people who feel that they're disadvantaged and those who claim to speak for them are demanding an equality based on numbers. So if purple people are 17% of the population, then 17% of the professors should be purple. And if less than 17% of the population in any one field is 
purple, then there must be some systemic oppression of purple people. So this social justice ideology demands an equality based on numbers, whereas the traditional part of the society is looking for a different kind of equality based on merit. Now let's talk for a second about this guy Draco, because Solon didn't want to be like him. Draco was the tyrant who ruled Athens before Solon did. He wrote these laws saying that if you stole a cabbage, you would be put to death. Solon said that Draco had written his laws not in ink, but in blood. So from this guy Draco, there's this expression which you might come across. We call something draconian when it's absurdly severe. Solon didn't want to be draconian. He didn't want to abuse his power by stuffing laws down people's throats. He wanted to rule by consent and consensus. He didn't want to be a tyrant. So, in contrast to Draco, Solon ruled much more carefully and realistically. There's a very trenchant paragraph on this in Plutarch. He says, Solon acted where he thought people would accept his proposals or submit to pressure. He adapted his laws to the situation, not the situation to his laws. When asked if he had given the Athenians the best laws, he said, the best they would accept. Now, I know some of you have suggested that this made Solon more of a follower than a leader. You see him as giving into peer pressure, as if he needs to take the idea of justice more seriously. But I see this as Solon being realistic. Solon is a careful thinker. He's traveled the world, he's been successful in business, he's been successful in the military and in government, and so he's a thoughtful guy. But at the same time, he has this challenge of trying to lead Athens without either becoming a tyrant or having the people ignore his laws. And in fact, Anacharsis mocks Solon for thinking that mere laws can curb injustice. He says, You spin out laws like spider's webs. They'll restrain the weak, but the powerful will tear them to shreds. So Solon deliberates carefully about his laws, trying not to be too harsh or too lenient. He finds a kind of golden maxim in his belief that, as he says, people do obey the law when no one gains from breaking it. And so we see Solon trying to appeal to the common aggregate of self-interest. He's being expedient. And in this connection, when we get into the second semester, we get into a guy named Machiavelli and the idea of the Machiavellian, an extremely expedient, practical view of politics. In this vein, some people define politics as the art of the possible. The point is that if it's not even possible, why would you be fretting a lot about it or debating it or proposing it or trying to do it? So there's this idea that, in fact, good leaders really follow the people they lead. They read the room, or they read the market, or they read the electorate. They say, let's harness all those energies, let's put them together and get something done. I see Solon as a wise man in that sense. He says, I'm not going to do anything false or bad, but I'm going to take the intersection between two things, what's good and what's possible. If it's good but impossible, I'm not going to try it. If it's possible but bad, I'm not going to do it. But if it's both good and possible, let's go. But you can't say he gave into peer pressure or just followed the people. Because, in fact, as Plutarch knows, the people actually hated a lot of his laws, and they wanted to change them. They were begging him to use his power to change these laws, and he said no. He said, live with my laws for ten years while I go to talk philosophy with priests in Egypt, so you can't change the laws. So I think that showed some leadership. It's not the traditional politician who gets in there and fights with both knuckles. His way of winning is to walk away and come back and see if the problem has resolved itself. As they say in the Vatican, the world is ruled by delaying. So I admire Solon. I might not have admired him when I was a 14-year-old boy full of testosterone and I wanted to fight like Hector and Achilles, but now that I'm older, I see some wisdom in his approach. He's sandwiched in between these two tyrants, Draco and Pisistratus, and he still manages to make Greece great. Now, in connection with Pisistratus, some of you question the wisdom of Solon leaving Athens for ten years precisely because of the danger of a tyrant taking over and undoing his work. But I would just flip that and say it shows the respect that the people had for him and the trust he had in the people. It also points to something very profound, because in many non-Western or less developed countries, the rulers are desperately afraid to travel overseas. Typically, whenever there's a coup d'etat, when they overthrow a government, the leader's traveling abroad. Out of sight, out of mind. The cat's away, the mice will play. 
Tyrants are unstable, but when you're someone like Solon, who is not a tyrant, and you do enjoy the support of the people because you don't push laws down their throat like Draco, then the situation is actually pretty stable. You can go away for ten years and come back, and it's still there. But in the end, try as he might, Solon wasn't able to stop the rise of Pisistratus after him. Just to put a pin on that, it reminds me again of the wisdom of Anacarsis, who warned Solon. Clever people write the laws, but fools make the decisions. In the end, the fools decided not to stand up to Pisistratus. In the end, the fools decided to give Pisistratus as many bodyguards as he wanted. And in the end, the fools decided to stop counting and stop caring how many bodyguards Pisistratus had. And then Pisistratus was like a fascist with his own stormtroopers, and he basically could go beat up people who disagreed with him. And that's how he took power through thuggery through the kind of stuff that goes on in Russia, where Putin jails his opponents, or this kind of stuff that goes on in Hong Kong under the Chinese, where if you write something in your newspaper we don't like, then we take over your newspaper and shut it down. Rule by sheer force and coercion. But the Athenians let that happen by being foolish. Now let's talk about Herodotus and the invention of the West. Herodotus is the first historian in the Western tradition. And the thing I want to flag about Herodotus is that it's really through him, more than any other writer, that Western civilization becomes a thing. It's through Herodotus that Western civilization first becomes conscious of itself, and it becomes conscious of itself as opposed to the other, and the other in this case is the East. Specifically, it's the Persians who live differently and have different customs, and whom the Greeks defeat in this great war which lasts 50 years. When they defeat the East in this war, the West starts to rise up and think, we're pretty great. And they kind of start believing in themselves and their own propaganda, and they get their confidence up, and they become aware of themselves as the West, as different from the East. That comes to us through Herodotus, who was fascinated by the East and traveled around collecting all these stories, legends, and myths of the East, their philosophy and their wisdom and their customs. He didn't look down on the East at all. In fact, he clearly looked up to the East and saw it as superior in some ways. To begin with, it was an older, elder civilization, older by thousands of years. But the bottom line is, Herodotus realized they're different, and we're different. This is who they are, and this is who we are. So with that awareness begins this idea of Western identity. In realizing these differences, Herodotus becomes the first one to hit upon an idea that we now call cultural relativism. It means that what you believe depends on how you were raised and the customs of the particular area in which you live. So if you live in the Brazilian rainforest, you're going to take a big piece of wood and shove it into your lip and keep it there for 10 to 15 years because the people in that area think it's beautiful. But if you grew up here, you think that's nonsense. So the idea is that your cultural values are relative to your background. Now, in a certain sense, that seems obviously true, but then some people take it further and say, well, if that's true, there is no such thing as good or bad or right or wrong because everyone lives differently, so who's to say what's right or wrong for everyone? You will meet people in your schooling who argue that way. But it's Herodotus who really first gives us that, and he gives us that in the following lines. He says... If one could order all mankind to choose the best set of rules in the world, each group would, after due consideration, choose its own customs. Each group regards its own as by far the best. And so then Herodotus quotes the poet Pindar, saying, Custom, king of all mortals and immortals, guides them with a sovereign hand. So the idea is that custom really rules everything, and Herodotus is the first writer to put forward this idea in a systematic way. Herodotus is also the first writer in which we encounter something that we now call Orientalism. It's a recent term that comes from a guy called Edward Said, a Palestinian scholar at Columbia, with whom I had the opportunity to study when I was there as a graduate student. Said said, look, you Westerners always write about the East in a patronizing way. You're exoticizing us. You're stereotyping us. You're otherizing us. And certainly Herodotus portrays the Persians as somehow different from us, more exotic, living in luxury, more sensuous, sexually perverted. These are classic motifs of Orientalism. Now, to be fair, Easterners have their own way of westernizing us or occidentalizing us. 
They look at us in ways that are stereotyped, too. It's just that no one has chosen to write about that. Finally, I want to say a few things about Pericles' funeral oration. One of the things that's important there is that Pericles says, We heed not just written laws, but the customs of an unwritten code, which we cannot break without disgrace. This idea of a higher law, an unwritten law, but one that's still a binding law, is extremely important in the Western tradition. We'll see it in Socrates tomorrow, but we also see it in Martin Luther King, saying there's a higher law, and I listen to that higher law. That's a very Greek idea and a very Western idea, which you don't really find in other cultures. It comes off in a couple of other places in Pericles' speech, too. He says, We trust less in a system of policy than in the native spirit of our citizens. Our courage comes not from art, but from nature. So the idea is there's something beyond what humans create in which they tap into. It's a law of nature, the law of God, the laws of our own character, which we follow. A couple more famous quotes. Pericles says, We serve as the school of Greece. By that he means that all Greece learns from us, which was basically true. Now, Athens learned from the Ionian philosophers earlier, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. But basically, once Athens came together under Solon and Pericles, they really were the cultural center of the Greek world. So, we serve as the school of Greece is a very famous quote. Heroes have the whole earth for their tomb. Far from needing a Homer for our eulogist, our fame does not depend on the momentary charm of verses of poetry which melt at the touch of fact. Instead, we have made every sea and land the highway of our daring, and everywhere have left imperishable monuments behind us. In other words, our eternal glory is based on our achievements, and that means a lot more than one little slab of stone in the ground saying that someone lived and he died. And then one last thing. One of the themes of this speech is meritocracy. The Athenians let their people advance based on their talent. It doesn't matter if you're poor, you can still have a great chance. Athens became great through men with the spirit of adventure, men ashamed to fall below a certain standard. You can't get much more explicit than that in putting excellence out there as your standard. We don't care if you're rich, you're poor, you're whatever, although females and slaves were left out, obviously. But within the realm of people who were citizens, they claimed to seek out talent and excellence. These were their conscious ideals. And the Western project over time has been to extend the circle of these ideals so that now they are supposed to apply to everyone. 